right. How about we just give us like one more minute for more people to join? That sounds good. All right, I think we can get started. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Yare, today's host. Um, it's been a great pleasure for us to have invited Dr. Mike Bayuki from uh, Stanford University here uh, to give, a, give this great, amazing speech for our July uh, webinar. So before I um, jump down to introducing Mike and uh, handing over the microphone, let me just spend a couple of minutes, like uh, three or four minutes, to introduce to you guys, just in case many of you who just joined as a Dashu membership. Um, so uh, Dashu is founded uh, about five years ago. We are a 501c nonprofit organization. Um, we have many strategic partners and joining us is definitely free of membership charge. And we also accept all kinds of fundings that goes directly to serve the community with very low administrative cost. We do organize a lot of events. Unfortunately, given the current pandemic, COVID-19, that we uh, canceled all of the off <laughs> the, the real world uh, events, but we still host our monthly journal clubs for the remaining of this year. So we are always seeking active volunteers to help us. So whenever you have any questions, please reach out to our email and please do follow our social uh, media, all kinds of social media accounts. So every time, as many of you who have joined before, you already know that all of the recordings and slides are going to be freely available on our website, as well as if you follow our YouTube channel uh, that is under the name Dashu, definitely check out, stay tuned, uh, just in case if you miss the previous uh, beautiful uh, monthly journal clubs. So we still are needing lots of your support. Uh, we're uh, conti continuously looking for more speakers and topics to join and give us uh, great speeches. And also we need your support and help to promote the event. And um, uh, definitely we uh, would love to have a lot of the supports from your funding. So every time when people register the event, uh, that is free, but feel free to, you know, just tip a few, a few bucks, it would be appreciated. And uh, last, not, and last but not least, we have many amazing volunteers working with us right now, and but we still look are looking for more volunteers. So if you're interested in joining, help us promoting and propagating our events, definitely uh, reach out through all sources of the social media that we posted earlier. And we're a, uh, we're a great team. We're like a big family. I myself the, am the, the volunteer lead, um, like full-time volunteer lead, part-time uh, uh, data scientist. So definitely reach out. We have a, a great culture in here. So uh, last but not least, let's come to the introducing the main cast. Today we have Dr. Michael Bayoki from uh, Stanford University. He's assistant uh, professor in the Department of Epidemiology and the Population Health, and also he's a STEM fellow in the Department of the Statistics. I know Mike is also a very active and also leading a very large random trials of sex assault prevention intervention in Kenya, which is actually very impressive. So today we're going to hear more uh, about his talk. That's gonna, I highlighted a few keywords in here, but uh, that's gonna be focusing on asking the causal effects in multiple study design, for example, some observational study. So uh, without further ado, I see as we can see, uh, there are still more people to join. So before I hand over the microphone to Mike, I just wanna everybody, uh, I just wanna ask everybody to keep uh, muted. Uh, so whenever you have any questions, feel free to, to uh, put your question in the chat box. We will have about like five minute to 10 minute, depend on Mike, uh, like of the Q&A session, we can go over some of the questions that you asked. So um, let me hand over the sh screen sharing right to Mike. Mike, can you uh, uh, probably unmute yourself and start sharing your slides, is that okay? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, 
So I want to start off by saying thank you to the organizers. Um, this is a really great opportunity. And I, you know, it really like sort of hit home. Um, you know what? I'm not sure I can share my screen right now. Um, am I, can I get the ability? Uh, Mike, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Apologies, I'm, I'm hitting it, but it says the host has disabled. Oh. All right, let me look into this. Now I've got it. That working now? Awesome. Mike, Great. we can see your slides. Wonderful, thanks. So I want to start off by saying thank you uh, to in, you know, invite me to this group and talk. You know, over the past two days, I've gotten a bunch of emails from my statistician friends um, saying that they saw my name came through on this listserv, and uh, it just it just like strikes home how much of a wonderful group um, uh, you folks have put together. Thank you. So, so today, um, what I want to do is show you some careful thinking that our team did about a natural, ex um, or sorry, about this policy intervention. And I'm gonna, I have to tee it up in terms of the policy you could, so you can see the hard parts. Um, but what I'm gonna really try to do is get you to the idea of target trials, uh, which, which I've got a paper citation here for you um, if you wanna follow up on, and also instrumental variables, but also really pulling apart a study into smaller parts. And uh, that, will help you do things like build a sensitivity analysis uh, and also like find the problems, okay? So I, I'm assuming that not a lot of people, I'm not, or I'm making the assumption that there are a lot of different backgrounds. So I'm going to try to use lots of pictures and try to make this as accessible as possible. Um, but uh, I also wanna like recognize that there's a lot going on here. So feel free to ask questions. I can't quite see the uh, chat box, but we'll try to get them uh, at the end. So this, this work that I'm going to talk to you about is um, in a circulation um, article, and, and here's the citation, I'll, and I'll, uh, you'll have access to this later on. So we're going to be talking about acute aortic dissections, and the aorta is like, uh, comes out of the heart and carries the blood to the most important parts almost immediately. And so this is, a, this is a, the aorta, um, and on the left here you can see that there are starting to form ruptures. And this like there this like black pockets around it. That's where the heart, the, the blood has started to seep out. Um, this is the ascending. So this is a type A dissection. And over here, this is a type B where it's on the lower part. Type A is super scary. Um, it like for a number of different reasons. Um, but one is that it's extremely deadly. But it's also really like hard issue to diagnose. It has this like phantom ability, it's sort of like a mimics, a lots of things, could be feel like back pain, could feel like a regular heart attack, but it's one of the most deadly conditions that we have to deal with. And what makes it even scarier is that like, it doesn't happen very often. So it's, it's not something that happens enough that people recognize it. But as soon as they recognize it, they realize it's extremely challenging. So in the first 24 hours, if you don't get treated immediately with an acute type A dissection, aortic dissection, about 25 people, 25% uh, will die. Um, and after two, uh, two days, it go, uh, grows to 40%. And this is like, again, uh, I can't stress enough, this is one of those conditions that terrifies um, folks in the emergency departments because they know that time is of the essence and we're really talking about a very serious life or death uh, issue. So as soon as they figure out that there's a type A dissection going on, they'll just rush you right, they'll clear out the operating room, they'll get you there. And even if we can get you to the operating room, there's still a high percentage of people who will die. So this is a real scary, time-dependent, life and death kind of situation. And here's what we're gonna be doing today is like, you know, the challenge analytically is going to be thinking about how, you know, um, we're going to be going for a policy uh, situation, but what if we were to, it's a really scary situation, but start moving people around. Maybe there are certain kinds of hospitals that have an easier time in uh, treating this and some that have a harder time. So here's a picture, a map of the, the Bay Area. 
Um, we've got a couple of hospitals sort of spread out, and here's a big hospital. This one I've sort of located uh, at Stanford, um, partly because it's my home team, I love Stanford, but uh, it's also a big regional hospital that's really good and actually is the first one that diagnosed and talked about type A dissection. So they're very famous for treating that. So a lot of the hospitals in this area, when they figure out there's a type A acute dissection, they'll send to Stanford. The question is, is that a good idea? Because again, people think that's really time dependent and maybe we're like, we're wasting time by moving them. Changing them inter facility um, could be bad because maybe you want to treat them early, but maybe the benefits of treating at a high volume facility is really good. In fact, we see in our data that people will even fly out from Hawaii um, to, to get treated for this. The, you know, recently people um, will uh, get diagnose it, put someone in a very stable condition and then put them on airplane and get them out. So there's some belief that like regionalizing the care um, can be really helpful. And we know that this is true for lots of other kinds of medical conditions that re get really complicated. If you send them to a high volume facility, send them to a big hospital, things will probably turn out better. Um, and that's probably because of like the surgeons have really good experience, but also like all the other care that's going on after the operation is probably also organized in, in different ways. <clears throat> but again, I wanna really emphasize that what we're, we're concerned about is there might be time sensitivity that these cases are really fragile. So the policy question is what would happen if we took all of the small facilities and started putting their type A dissections uh, and requiring them to move to a high level facility. And this is like a causal question because we can think about either treating people for, the, for uh, dissections at a low, low volume facility or a high volume facility. And I've simplified here, right? You can already recognize that there are different kinds of hospitals. It's not just about like how many patients they treat. But if we were to do this in an ideal situation to answer this causal question, we, we can think about what we would do ideally, which is maybe something like, individually randomized patients to either get their care, their surgeries at a high volume facility or low volume. So we can like flip a coin. But almost immediately, there are logistical challenges in the real world for running a randomized trial like this to answer this question of like, what's the benefit? Should we be moving people to the high level facility? First is you can't really identify patients until they're at a facility. So this dissection is really sneaky. It looks like, you know, maybe you pulled your back muscles or maybe like you don't, you know, like you're just feeling lightheaded or something like that. It's really hard, even once you're in the emergency room to identify this, they have to start doing some scans before they can usually tell that this is a, a dissection. Um, and these patients are usually crashing pretty quickly and pretty hard. So that means that it's gonna be really hard to consent people in. Uh, so running a prospective randomized trial on the individual level is going to be really hard, even hypothetically for logistical reasons. And I'm going to come back to this. This is not just like pie in the sky, silly stuff I'm talking about, because what this did, this sort of thinking through what we would do if we had all the money and the resources and time led us to the realization that in practice, if we were to run a randomized trial to try to answer this question, we would actually run a cluster randomized trial. We would go to different hospitals and say, hey, um, you are a low volume facility, we've flipped a coin and we'd like you to, as soon as you see a uh, dissection patient, send them to a high level facility or um, to keep them here and treat them here. You, you, that would be probably the correct level of randomization uh, for a number of different logistical reasons. Um, and that insight, thinking about like, what is the kind of target randomized trial that we would design gave rise to our study design that I'm gonna show you today using instrumental variables. Now I have this paper here by Miguel Hernan and Jamie Robbins, two most wonderful like thinkers um, in causal inference right now. And so I wanna point you to that because that's, that's the kind of like underlying ideas that I'm gonna be talking about today. So here's kind of like, for me, the fun part, um, like what are we trying to do here? What is the causal inference? What's the, what, what, the, what are the key issues? So we've got two different types of hospitals. On the left, you've got some small hospital uh, in rural Maine where I grew up. And then you've got this big fancy hospital on the right-hand side, uh, you know, that, the new one that we just built here at Stanford. The idea is we've got patients showing up at these two facilities. And if you look at the rates um, of death for the dissection at the low facilities, the small facilities, it's like 35% are dying. Uh, and you would think that something like 10% would, would be dying over here at these bigger facilities. That's not actually the case. 
So these big facilities like have worst outcomes. If you look at the patients who show up, like this seems really counterintuitive. But in this picture, if you look down below at the patient that's going in, what's happening here is like we're getting different kinds of patients. And I know this is like over, overly simple for folks who have seen calls inputs before, but the idea that I really wanna drive home is, I think what happens is people look at the outcomes and they see variation there, and then they see that there's variation in the treatment, and they kind of implicitly assume that there was no variation in the inputs. And so if that were true, if you had variation in the outcome and the only difference was the treatment, then yeah, you can say that the difference in the outcome was due to the treatment. This is known as the method of difference. But oftentimes in the real world, everybody knows this is a big fancy hospital and they're gonna start sending these sicker patients to them. And that now the difference in the outcome is some compositional effects of both the treatment type and the patients who showed up. Here's another way to show what I'm talking about. Our, our, this is a directed acyclic graph. We've got the outcome of interest, we've got some treatment, and we've got like this causal effect. How much does the treatment type, going to a high facility, you know, big volume, small volume, what's the causal effect? How much does that change the outcome? And the issue that I'm just describing here is what's known as like a common cause uh, confounder. So you've got some other set of variables. You know, so if we know that the patient's sick, uh, he's older, he's had multiple surgeries before, we're more likely to send him to a big hospital, but he's also more likely to die. And the issue here is that that X is causing both the treatment to change and the outcome to change. And all of a sudden, like, it gets really hard. It, can, it could be the case that there's a real causal connection or there might not be a causal connection, but either way, that X variable is gonna make it look like T and Y are correlated and changing together. And that might make you think that there's like a causal effect when in fact there's not. So a lot of causal inference, especially in observational studies is obsessed about trying to get rid of one of these two arrows, um, either maybe like by using propensity scores or maybe like by using prognostic scores, you remove one of those arrows and you can get good causal inference, get a good, see if there's a good connection, see if there's a real connection between T and Y. That's the idea of common cause confounding. That's what we're gonna be sort of worried about. And so randomized trials are super good at reducing that challenge of common cause um, confounding. And it's this one-two punch. It's got two things going on. I'm gonna to try to draw some pictures really quickly um, to help you like just definitely make sure you feel comfortable with that. But randomized controlled trials, um, first off, one of the big differences is you start with a particular person who's been recruited and you can put them by, by any process you want into one of those two treatments. And that's important because like you can sort of like uh, think about what could have happened to that person if we had done, you know, if we, they had gone down a different path. Um, and the assignment mechanism here that most people talk about is like flipping a coin. And that's the randomized part. And usually like if you're in doing an intro level stats class or you haven't done this for a while, like people will talk about, oh, we'll just flip a coin. And I just wanna pause and be like, we all know that flipping a coin is not random, right? It's completely deterministic. It's actually like, oh, there's all these force equations, right? Like the strength of my thumb, you know, moving, the friction of my thumb on my forefinger, the air velocity and like the, the you know, humidity in the air and that's gonna change it. And I wanna tell this like very small, funny little story, but like uh, Percy Diaconis, who's one of the world's best, most wonderful like probabilists who's, who's here, um, he, uh, he has this amazing trick where if you give him a coin, He'll like flip it a couple times, feel it, and then he can keep flipping it heads up over and over and over again. And I think that's like a super, you know, it's, first off, it's fun. You can like earn yourself a beer or whatever, like by, by fooling people. But um, it also really shows you that what's important and being invoked here is not the idea of like a stochastic, truly random in some fundamental way, uh, property, what's actually going on here is that the randomized control trial is using an assignment mechanism that is non-informative. So when I flip a coin, I'm not Percy, I, I don't know how to like flip a coin always heads, but I'm going to flip a coin and I don't like look at you and figure out all the things about you and then choose a different coin or flip it in a different way. I'm always going through some process and it'll come up heads and tails roughly equally, um, but it's not informed by how sick the patient is. 
So it's not that it's really random. I don't want people to think that. It's that it's an assignment mechanism that doesn't kind of like, quote unquote, look at the patient or use information about the patient, um, the, the, um, some of the variables that we're concerned about when it's doing its assignment. So technically it's sort of a conditional orthogonal like assignment mechanism. So we call it random, which is fine. It's actually really that like, it's a non-informative assignment. But the other part, is that in a randomized control trials, you also have to control for the nuisance variation. And so the idea, um, so I'm gonna to get to that in a series of pictures in just, uh, just after this. But the idea about the randomization is we have this common cause confounding, usually like the sicker patients will get the like higher level treatment, the more intense treatment, and that might impose correlation, make it look like the treatment's having an effect on the outcome, even when it isn't, or make it look like there's more of an effect, or maybe like, look like it's a not having effect. And the idea for randomization is that randomization comes in and it changes T. It really dominates. And actually, if you do a good randomization, it's like really randomizing. And it, to the point where the randomization is overwhelmingly in charge of assigning the treatment. Um, and now we've sort of gotten rid of that connection for the X variable, the, comma, the common confounder, to change the outcome and the treatment at the same time. The treatment is only being assigned by the randomization. And that makes everything so much easier for us to figure out as T changes, how does Y change? Here's the other part. Here's this um, the control part. So I, again, I don't want you, this is a very simple drawing, but I think sometimes like when we get into the fancy math, we lose sight of the elegance of some of the ideas um, that, that get us good causal inference. So we've got a bunch of people we recruited into treatment um, who will participate in our study. And we pick one in the bottom right corner there and we flip a coin and the coin came up tail. So we're gonna put them in the control. We can do that over and over and over again. And this is, you know, the way I just described that, you pick a person, you flip a coin, that's a uniform randomization. That's a very simple randomization, but it can really cause some problems, right? Like if I flip a coin for each one, that coin doesn't keep track of who ended up in the treatment, who ended up in the control, and we could end up with really big imbalances like this. So this would be silly. This would be not a randomization we want because you know, probably want to use half of our data in the treatment, half of it in the control, that kind of stuff. And it gets even more complicated when you have different kinds of people, right? Like every person is really different. And even if you constrain your randomization, you, all, you put control over it, you, you can have randomizations that have equal numbers of people, but now we've got really big imbalances, right? Like all the big circles are on the right, none of them on the left. And this is a, not a great randomization because the two groups start off different. Right? So if we see a difference in the outcome between treatment and control, it's not clear anymore. Like they, they really started off different. The control group, even though we randomized, looks different from the treatment group. I can't tell you, is the, is the outcome different because of the way they started or is it because they had treatment and control? So this is, um, this is where the idea of control um, as I see it um, enters, which is we can think about looking at the variables we're aware of. So maybe in this case, like size and color, we're gonna match and then we're gonna flip a coin. And one of them is gonna to go to the treatment, one of them is gonna to go to the control. And I've numbered these because it's gonna be kind of hard to track, right? So this time I flipped it and it came up head. So number one went in the treatment, but I could have flipped it the other way. And now um, number one is over in the control. And you can do this over and over again. And so what I've done there, and again, I know a lot of you have seen this stuff before, but like I've, we've uh, asserted control over the covariate distribution, but we've also introduced randomization uh, and what's kind of neat, I don't even know if you guys are noticing this, but I'm flipping through different randomizations right now, right? It's very subtle. And that's because the uh, easily observable covariates have been controlled and the randomization is dealing with the unobserved covariates that we're gonna be sort of like most concerned about. So this is the thing in the real world policy, this is the, the crux of the problem. And I'm gonna start talking more about our um, more practical, more, um, more of our example in just a minute, is we are really worried about variables that we don't see, the unobserved variables that are correlated with treatment and outcome. And what we would love to do is have that randomization and have it overwhelm the treatment and really like assign the treatment, but we won't be able to get that. We won't be able to do that prospective. We don't have the resources, we don't have the money, but what we can do is find something that almost behaves like that. And that's gonna be this idea of an instrumental variable. Um, and I'm gonna explain one example of it. But uh, an instrumental variable behaves nearly identical to a randomized controlled trial. 
um, and the sort of properties of it, like, you know, randomizing the unobserved variables, if you have a real one. And like the big debate always, always, always is that uh, maybe people think something's a randomizer, think something's an instrumental variable, but it really isn't. And so I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about that to give you a sense of one instrument that, that we use. Okay, so um, going back to this type A dissection, we've got Medicare data. And so we've got about 15 years worth of data and we have all of the type A patients there, so 12,500 of them. And we have about 30 baseline covariates, so information about how sick these patients were before they, um, before they showed up at the hospital. And what I'm showing you here on the right, and I know this is super hard to see, but the paper is, um, is, is linked, so you'll be able to, to grab it. Um, but we've got a bunch of variables here, and what we're showing here is maybe like a table one, known as like a balance table, and it tells you that, holy, uh, wow, like look at the treatment, look at the control, they really look different even before they showed up. So we're sort of worried about that. Um, let's see. So here is the moment where I'm starting to show you something that might be really pretty new, which is when we were thinking about that cluster randomized trial, if we were to run a prospective randomized trial, we would go to a hospital and convince them, flip a coin, and then convince them to either send all their patients or keep all their patients. What we realized is actually, it turns out that that's happening in the real world. Not perfectly, but almost. And what I've got here is a histogram. I've got the number of patients on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, I have the hospital transfer rates. Up here on the right-hand side, that's a hospital. These are hospitals um, patients, I guess, that are patients that are attending a hospital where um, that they showed up at a hospital where they're always sent to another hospital for care. And down here at the zero. These are the patients who showed up at a hospital who always keep their patients. So I'm looking at the transfer rate. And check this out. Like it turns out that almost all of the patients either show up at a hospital that keeps the patients and treats them or show up at a hospital that you know, always sends the patients. And there are hospitals that do both, right? There's some here that are more like 50%, some that are 40, some that are 80, some that are 20. And what I would argue is that this middle ground here, somewhere between zero and one, those hospitals are tough for us because they're gonna be doing that sorting. They're gonna look at a patient, see how sick the patient is, and they're gonna decide, do we send them or do we not? What's much better for us is to use hospitals that are always sending or never sending uh, and, and have a set up that sort of pattern because they're almost behaving like they were like assigned by um, some prospective design. Here's the next thing which makes our study even kind of like I think neater, which is that this group here uh, of on the far right with um, all the hospital, the hospitals that always send, if we look at just those, here's another histogram of just those hospitals where on the x-axis now we're looking at where do they send them? And it turns out that again, it's bifurcated. We've got two peaks on the extremes. So of the hospitals that send, um, some of them, roughly half of them, always send them to a low volume. And on the other one, uh, they always send them to a high level hospital. And this is really neat. And again, like there's not a lot that sort, but I would say in the middle here, these are the most problematic hospitals because they're the ones that are sometimes sending to a high level hospital and sometimes sending to a low level hospital. So they're making intentional kinds of decisions. Um, so taken together, this is kind of like a two-stage cluster randomized trial that we found by, you know, um, in the data. It was a naturally occurring experiment. So the first stage is that someone shows up at a hospital and then the hospital realizes that they have a type A dissection. And that hospital in our study is either going to always send people or always treat them. And that's this. And then from the ones that always send, they bifurcate. They, they, we're gonna look at just the extremes where we always uh, send them to a high level hospital or always send them to a low level hospital. And the cutoff here that we're using is high volume hospitals treated more than 10 type A dissections um, and other ones uh, sent, uh, had fewer. So in that like regionalization, again, we've got high level hospitals and low level hospitals. And high level hospitals almost always just keep their patients. They very rarely transfer them, but sometimes they'll transfer them to like another big hospital, like maybe like a bigger hospital. 
Um, some of the other low-level hospitals will also keep their patients, and they tend to be sort of further away and not be able to get to very easily other high-level hospitals. Um, other low-level hospitals will always send. Um, and then these are the hospitals that we're kind of worried about, which are hospitals that sometimes send, sometimes keep. And then the other one in the bottom left there um, is a low-level hospital that sometimes sends to high and sometimes sends to low. We don't want to use these hospitals because they're introducing sorting. They're not like sort of quote unquote randomizing their patients into always getting the treatment or always getting the control. They're not compliant. So what we've ended up with is something like an unbalanced two by two table where we can either think about the benefit of tr uh, transferring versus staying or how much, like this is like, you know, this here transfer versus stay, we can isolate the effect of putting someone in an ambulance and sending them from my hospital to another one. So what does that do? We probably think that that probably doesn't help you. Just the mere act of putting you in an ambulance and like uh, trying to get you to another place. Um, but that's an important part. If we're gonna think about regionalizing care, we have to know like what kind of decrement, how much that might that be hurting people. And that's counterbalanced by, we think getting care at a high level hospital is a lot better than getting um, uh, care at a low level hospital. So we've sort of got this two by two unbalanced um, randomization. And so, yeah, so we'll include hospitals that always send to low and hospitals that, uh, that are low that also keep. Um, you can imagine, and I'm going to come back to this when I get to the reviewer challenges and why we started using another natural experiment, but you can imagine that this is largely, these practices are largely due to regional things, right? So like, um, in the intermountain, like, you know, like not very densely populated part of the United States, there's not very many large hospitals. Um, and so sending them would require a lot of travel. Um, and, and so maybe that's an issue. Maybe what we're finding when we compare and we do our study is a difference, not between high and low level hospitals, but between like different parts of the United States. So you have to be really aware, like you have to be very careful about like how we're setting this stuff up. So the first thing with an instrumental variable is like, is it really random? Is it technically, is it like orthogonal? And um, you have to do some real careful thinking. You have to argue with your colleagues and you have to like, uh, you know, uh, go through, you can't just say this is an instrument. You can't just say this is random. So we, have, we did a lot of thinking about like, why are hospitals always sending and always keeping? And some of it has to do with locations, but it also has to do with their practices. Um, they sort of get used to, they set up protocols within the hospitals themselves. And so part of that is like just what they're following. Some of it also has to be able, uh, about like, um, uh, you know, do they have the beds or the surgeons available? Um, and uh, do they have the capacity to do that? Um, and then why are they also like sending to just one type? And that might, again, be due to proxy or it might be due to like travel time, might be due to uh, other sorts of considerations. And here's the thing is in our setting, we're able to punt a little bit. We're able to sort of not answer all of these questions so much because what we're doing is we're looking at the hospitals in practice, like in the data who always sent. So they had to have two or more type A dissections and they always sent them to the uh, another facility or they always kept them or when they sent them they always sent to a higher low so we we know from the data that they always chose to do one type of sending um, so the real question for us to think about where the randomness is coming from is like how did patients end up at a hospital and in a lot of literature it's due to proximity if I get a um, if I start having like a, what feels like a heart attack or if I start feeling really faint I'm going to go to the closest hospital and different hospitals have different catchment areas and sometimes they can be overlapping and that kind of stuff. But a large chunk of why people end up at a hospital, especially for an emergency. So less so if you're having like hip surgery, but if you're really worried about like, I might die right now, you're going to go to the closest hospital. But again, like there's, there's some real issues here about like, you know, some of these overlap regions and the ambiguities there. So most people at this point, point in like a paper would sort of say, we're using the proximity um, for an emergency care. That's going to determine like he was at work when he got the heart attack or he had these symptoms. So they brought him to the closest hospital. That's kind of random. Um, but we didn't stop there. We had, we, I lucked into this. I was teaching this undergrad class, this big like um, intro level stats class. And I had this student come up to me. It was a wonderful student, Kristen Oshberg, who was really interested 
and um, this kind of stuff. And he had been an emergency medical technician. He'd been an EMT for a number of years. So what he wanted to do was he went out into the real world and tracked down this instrument. What he, we did is we did a mixed methods approach where we went out and we talked to a bunch of EMTs, the people who drive the ambulances um, or, or provide care in, in, in the ambulance. Um, and, and looked at like emergency, emergency medical services decisions. And we like looked at like how they start making their decisions. We uh, set up some models um, such that we could elicit their trade-off uh, frontiers to understand how they were sorting their patients. And also tried to understand, could they detect whether a patient actually had a type A dissection or not? And it turns out that most people and this is the right thing, do not try to assess for a type A dissection. So it really wasn't like people were sorting based on what they knew. We also pulled a bunch of protocols um, for California and around the world, uh, or sorry, around the United States to look at like how people are sorting. And then we found a database um, that talked about um, every time you're transported in an ambulance, they have to document some of the choices and some of the care that was provided. And so there's a this database that's, uh, um, Oh, I'm blanking. I believe it's managed out of uh, University of Utah. Oh, I forget now. Um, but it's a really a, you know rich database about all the care that's provided. And it turns out that a lot of the decisions are driven by proximity, 40% of them, about where they're going to get care. And then uh, the other 50% is about like you know the patient family making a decision, which again probably under it all is based on like how easy it is to get to the hospital. So what am I doing here? Is like let's pause. Like. We spent a lot of time, we spent, you know, six months and talked to a lot of people. And what we were doing is uh, trying to be able to convince people that it was close to a random process, how people were ending up at this hospital. And it's really important. I want to emphasize this because like, we're going to make a call here to like publish something that says like, we should be changing how this life and death procedure should be treated. And so it really mattered a lot to me and the other folks that we weren't just making something up, that we really knew that this behaved like a randomizer, that this um, you know, facility thing really was acting. Not, I can't ever guarantee it's perfect, but as close as possible to something um, like, a, like a randomizer. And that was really sort of a, a fun, interesting way to sort of like get all the way there. So I want to say thank you to Christian on that. So let's talk about the results um, of our primary analysis. And then, I'm gonna sh and then I'll have um, time to show you how we address some reviewer pushback. And I think that's maybe probably the most interesting part uh, um, for the, this lecture today, um, for this talk today. So here's the big table. This is our, yay, we finished the paper and here's all the things you should know. And I wanna draw your attention to the upper right-hand corner. And what, in particular, what we're doing here is we're, this is the um, regionalized analysis. So it says, what would happen, the not re, uh, regionalized is this. So what if we just continued um, treating type A dissections as they currently are being treated? Or how do we, uh, what would it be like if we switched everybody over to being regionalized? And our estimate was that you would only need to do this for 14 patients before you started saving lives. Um, and this is a big effect. So like that's, you know, in part that comes from the fact that a number of people will die, but it also comes from the fact that the high level hospitals are doing a really good job. Uh, and so that was a really, um, that felt good that we were sort of seeing what we thought might happen. Um, it sort of matched some of the theories. Um, I didn't really get to talk a lot about this um, but there's a there's a number of new procedures that stabilize people and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of theory about like why we should start regionalizing care now and haven't been doing it previously. So this right here only needed 14 people to save a life. That's an that's a that's a really useful um, number, an insight, and started motivating people to think about like should you know we should probably start regionalizing this care for the statisticians for the data folks. We also slip this in, which I think is really important. I'm gonna give you a citation here, which is we did a gamma sensitivity analysis. So what a, a modern sensitivity analysis does is it says, we have a bunch of assumptions and uh, some of them are really vulnerable. Some of them might not be true. What is the impact of a, vi of a violating this assumption? And I want to give a lot of credit because there's a lot of like really good versions of this. Miguel Hernan, Jamie Robbins came up with one. Um, uh, the one that I'm using here is from Paul Rosenbaum, uh, Tyler Vanderweel, and 
I'm blanking on the rest of the team also came up with a, a E uh, values. So what, what these are is in an observational study for common, if you're worried about common cause confounding, there's a couple of these gamma sensitivities, E values, alpha sensitivities, where you can say how much unobserved bias, or sorry, unobserved covariates would there have to be before my analysis is called into question. So just quickly like give you an analogy is like, I build a bridge and I look at that bridge and I can tell you, oh, it can withstand an earthquake of size eight. Uh, on the, um, I can't tell you what earthquake might be coming, but if I look at that study, if I look at that bridge, I can tell you it can withstand this amount of damage or whatever. And so that's what this gamma is doing. And this gamma says something like, uh, yeah, even though we use this instrumental variable, even though we were able to find this pseudo randomizer, maybe it wasn't perfect, maybe there's still some problems with it. How much, like how much of a problem would there have to be before our analyses go away? So I wanna make sure that you guys are aware of that because that's a really good like way to deal with some of the criticisms you'll get from reviewers, but there are modern sensitivity analyses, gamma sensitivity, alpha sensitivity, and E values. And so um, I won't delve into this a lot, but like it turns out that it's really important, not, not just like surviving immediately, but like living many more years um, if you go to a high level facility. Um, and this one's a little bit complicated, but what we're trying to say here is that um, it's not just that like there's a difference between small hospitals and big hospitals, but it seems to even persist like the bigger the hospital, the more of a reduction uh, in mortality, which is that kind of makes sense. That's a good thing to find. Okay. Um, and again, this is the paper where we were talking about all of that. Here's where we started getting real pushback from the reviewers. And this is why it was really important for us to design, like decompose our um, policy into several parts, because then we could build these sensitivity analyses. First is we isolated the effect of, like I showed you earlier, that two by two table of how much does a high level hospital help you versus a low level. But in order to get you there, we have to transfer you. So maybe transferring you causes a problem, makes you less likely to live. And then only once we have those two parts can we put it together and think about what does regionalization, what would, what would it take to get us to regionalization? So we decompose the policy question, regionalization versus the current system into subparts. And that allowed us to think about two challenges, one of which, I, and I don't have enough time to talk about it today, but it's in the paper, is um, during transfer, if a patient died, they would like disappear from our data. We didn't get to really look at them. And so these censored people, these are not, um, not even like, you know, like we can't see them. How do we deal with that? And so we came up with a sensitivity analysis for, for that, thinking about how many patients would have had to have died and not shown up in our data set before our analysis goes away. The one thing I'm gonna talk to you about is this funny challenge um, which I call the canary in the coal mine kind of analysis where when we looked at transfer, if we had done a different kind of uh, study design, we would have found a bizarre result, which showed that there was a problem of early, early warning that that kind of analysis would have, uh, was doing funky things. Okay, so let me be a little bit more clear about that. So the reviewers and, um, you know, when we were talking about this paper in general, people were really worried about us sort of, quote unquote, throwing out data. Remember, um, I had those two, like, you know, basically this guy right here, those two groups where hospitals never send and always send, and we were getting rid of this red region here. The reviewers were really worried that we were kind of throwing out certain, excuse me, types of hospitals. And that, that makes sense to me. I mean, like maybe there's different kinds of care being provided there. They were also sort of worried about regionalization effects. And, and they were also sort of were worried that we, isn't more data better? Shouldn't you be able to use these folks here, not just the ones on the, not just the ones on the edges? So what they're, what they were talking about, um, and this is tough, like as a statistician, uh, it wasn't apparent to me at first, but like I slowly realized that what they were saying is we would actually prefer a propensity score um, we're thinking about the target randomized trial, not as a cluster randomized trial, not as like hospitals randomizing, but we would really like to be able to think about randomizing individual people. And 
Um, again, I want to say thanks to Jamie Robbins and Miguel Hernan for giving us these ideas about target randomized trials because it made me realize where the challenges would be. It'd be really in that sorting mechanism, that, that moment where people were trying to decide, should we be sending them? Should we be keeping them? So the difference between randomizing at the hospital level versus what, the, what implicitly the reviewers are asking for, which is a propensity score analysis where we're looking at all of the people and looking at who started it, who got care at the high, who got care at low. They wanted the individual level analysis. It made us realize that um, the biases would come at the individual level and we should look at that. So, um, sorry, that was a very high level. Let me, let me try to say that in a different way. So, this is that table I showed you before. This is from our instrumental variable analysis. And um, you know, we found that 14 people needed to be treated before we saved a life. But this part of this table here, this is when we looked at what's the impact of moving a patient. So this is the transfer. So we put them, we, a patient shows up, we assess them, they're like, oh man, this is a type A dissection, I'm super scared, let's, let's move them. Um, versus a, a place that's like, oh man, this is type A, we need to treat them now, right? So this is the effect of like putting someone in a hospital, oh, sorry, in an ambulance and moving them. That's what we're trying to isolate. And what we find here, uh, yeah, so it's, it's these, it's these arrows here from like low to low, low to high. We're trying to figure out what's the uh, impact of moving folks and just moving folks. And what we find here, which is consistent with our th theory, is that it might do something. Probably not though, right? I mean, the p-value is pretty high. It's sort of something close to zero, which is sort of reassuring because like, um, we couldn't track down really high quality data here, but we talked to the uh, EMTs, the emergency medical technicians, and there's not a lot of these kinds of deaths. They don't even see these kinds of patients a lot, but they don't tend to see, um, see that. And, but we couldn't like sort of lock down the, the exact number of patients. Um, but we had a good sense that there weren't a lot of type A dissection folks dying in transit. So what if we were to use all of the data? So this is, we were responding to the reviewers who were really concerned about us carving out the middle section, only using the hospitals that always send or always keep or always go to low, always go to high. And instead doing a propensity score analysis where we're comparing patients as if they had been randomized at the individual level, as if um, someone said, you will get your care at the high level hospital no matter what, or get your care at the low level hospital no matter what. And what we have here is exactly what we were worried about and this is the canary in the coal mine, is when we do this analysis, this is a different table, this is for the propensity score, this is for using all of the observations. What we see here is that um, there's an absurd conclusion that we would draw if we took everything literally here. And that is that if we put people into a ambulance and we drove them around the block and then we brought them back to our own hospital and we treated them, that that would help save lives. And that's a weird idea, right? I mean, what's probably, that, that doesn't make sense. Like putting someone in a hospital, just moving them and then bringing them back is just to the same hospital, it's just crazy. So what's, what's happening here um, is that there's still residual confounding, that there's still some unobserved variables. Even when we're aware of all of the X variables, even though we had 30 variables, um, when we're doing a propensity score, when we're trying to say like, let's compare people who went to the high level and low level hospitals, um, there's still some of those U variables, those unobserved variables that are still making the, making the doctors and the patients decide, let's send the healthier patients and keep the sicker patients is, is what it comes down to. And the fact that it came out significant was really compelling to the reviewers to say, oh man, you're right. Like when you do it this way, it tells me that the canary has died, that like something bad here is happening and it's happening at a threshold um, that we can detect, but like um, is maybe not enough, yeah, is, is not enough to see in the overall. Okay, so I think I introduced uh, the points that I wanted to, and I haven't been able to like sort of monitor the chat, but I think we've got some time. So I wanna give you a couple takeaways. Um, so one, the first thing is, and I'm sorry I did this to you, but I made you aware of a very serious medical condition. It can really happen and it can be really scary, but you can get good care. Um, if you end up with some serious health conditions, like some, uh, like th some things that look like a heart attack, you might want to know where a high volume center is. It looks like the care really is a substantially better at these high volume hospitals, enough to save many people's lives. Um, 
and that, by the way, this is scary. Sometimes I don't like working with these surgeons because I realize how, how fragile our bodies are. On the statistical analytical side, I want you to be paying attention to the plumbing, pay attention to the data. Think about with um, looking at like those histograms, um, knowing that people were sorting themselves, like that was a, a nice moment of insight. The other thing I want you to keep in mind is that a randomized control trial isn't magic. There's nothing there that like is um, qualitatively different than other sorts of data. It just tends to be um, the cleanest version of a good uh, way to collect data. So we can find randomizers that aren't as good. They're kind of broken, they have some issues. Um, but if we exercise some control and we think very carefully about what's pseudo randomizing, what's sort of going on real, we can get something that kind of behaves like a randomized trial, um, but not perfectly. But there's nothing like that makes it so different um, that like we can't find something that approximates it. I wanna be very, very clear here is that a randomized control trial is much better than an observational study, much better. Um, uh, but like in some settings, like in this setting, nobody's gonna run a randomized trial of a type A dissection without having good quality observational studies first, and maybe ever, maybe they won't even ever run a randomized trial of this because people are really scared of um, how, how um, difficult this is. So sometimes we need to make really good decisions based on the limited kind of data we have. Um, this is, uh, I owe this to Christian Ospert, um, that undergrad who helped me, is like when you go out to the real world and you start talking to people and thinking about how people end up in the treatment and control, you can come up with really good insights. And though we don't always do this with our um, analyses, like that extra effort of talking to the people who actually came up with or caused the data to happen can give you really valuable insights and can really help you build strong arguments. Great. Um, and the last point I wanna make is that you wanna keep your arguments simple. Make things look like a randomized trial so you can build a sensitivity analysis. Don't, don't always go for the fancy thing because it usually introduces too many assumptions. And if you keep it as simple as possible, um, you can help defend yourself. I wanna thank um, uh, a number of groups for supporting this research. Um, and I think uh, we have some time now to do some questions. All right, thank you, Mike. That was a beautiful speech. And uh, uh, we have more than 100 people joining today. And uh, I'm sure most of the audience, including myself, are definitely enjoying this. So let me go over to some of the questions that were posted. We have uh, Tom post this question. So Mike, uh, let me just read it to you. So uh, Tom asked, how does the ability uh, how does the ability to make this sometimes tricky diagnosis at different centers factor into the analysis here? And similarly, how do we identify the subjects for this study, the discharge diagnosis of the dissection, and how often are the subjects transferred for possible or rule out dissection? This is a really part. Yeah, there's a lot of parts going on here and like it's really good. And, and usually in like our medical version of this, well, we would go into this more. Um, but one of the big challenges in surgery is, and, and a lot of these like um, ICD-9 code kind of like settings is uh, we, and this, we need to move away from this, is that a lot of these patients are identified by, after they have received the care. Um, and so Tom's question here is really nice because it's like, we should be looking at people who have been diagnosed rather than identifying themselves, these patients through the care that they receive because it's a little bit too late. It'd be really nice to know the moment when a doctor starts realizing that something is happening and then the care gets sort of decided. So, um, so the first thing is in, in a lot of these applications, we identify patients through, their, um, uh, through the care that they receive, which is not ideal. Um, and let me, I'm looking at the question, make sure I answer all the parts of it. Yeah, I think there is a differential ability at the different facilities to identify, especially like um, uh, certain types, like there are sub types. I've sort of pretended that they're all similar type A dissections and some of them are more subtle than others. And I think that uh, a number, so the surgeons reassure me that 
uh, most people will find all of them, but there are subtle cases um, that would preferentially be selected at the high level hospitals that wouldn't be picked up at the low level hospitals. And their judgment there, and I'm, I'm a little bit out of my element at the moment, is that those are pretty close to being able to be medically managed until they continue to rupture. So finding them early would be really good. So what ends up happening, um, and I apologize for not having this super unlock, is that they essentially show up in our data set later and are exacerbated. Um, and that's when they first appear, um, if they were to show up at a low level facility. So um, there is a subtlety there where if we could, and this is really, you can't basically, we don't know how to do this right now. If you could identify people in the field um, with the type A dissection, that would be the best thing. We don't think we can get there right now. Um, and that would solve this part of the question, but I don't think it's actually possible right now. Thank you for your answer. So um, actually, Mike, I just I relatively have a following up question. So it looks like you mentioned yeah. briefly, like during the transport, people could die from it. That, that being said, some patients didn't really have the surgical intervention and uh, uh, die of the disease. Uh, it sounds like you didn't include this people in your analysis. Do you think that could potentially introduce uh, yeah. selection bias? So there are two types of patients or two types of patients who have type A dissections or had them and then didn't show up in our data set. One is uh, uh, the kind of patient that I mentioned, which is they were diagnosed at a low level facility but, or, or at a facility and then they were transported, but they died before they, they showed up at a facility. Um, so those patients disappear. We built it, and I didn't get to talk about it today, um, but in our paper is a sensitivity analysis for that. We can think about right. how many patients would have died along, um, uh, uh, needed to have died in order to render our results wrong or qualitatively wrong. Um, the other kind of patient is much more tricky and it has to do with sort of ethics and end of life care. There are some patients, like you can imagine if I, if I was 90 years old and I had a type A dissection, I personally might decide not to get care. Um, it's a fast way out, um, it is, painful, but not as bad as other things, and the surgery would be overwhelming for me. So I, I think that one's a, and, and the challenge for us there is like, would someone, like, would I make that decision differently if I was a low-level hospital versus a high-level hospital? That's kind of tricky. That one, I think, is a is a, another class of problems. Um, uh, but other than that, like, our, our guess is something like 95, 97% of people who are diagnosed um, end up getting uh, care, type A, get, get care. Okay, um, we have several more questions following up. Uh, just in case people, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself if you want to add a one last minute question. So we have a Gene asking, in general, what do you think are the pros and cons of clustered randomized versus individual level randomized RWB trials? So um, this, is a, uh, this is a tough one to answer quickly, but let me give you the, the most important things. Almost always, almost always individual level randomization is better. Um, if you can do that, uh, it gives you more statistical power. It lets you think more about um, what's going on with an individual person, and that's usually what we want. You can maybe do like better job with like heterogeneous treatment effect. It's clearly to your advantage if the situation allows to do an individual level randomization, but um, there are a lot of cases where you just can't. So in my in this paper, I was talking about like logistically, I don't think we could do it. Like so figuring out the person who to randomize and getting them into the study before we randomize them, just not feasible. Um, the other case where cluster randomized trials are really necessary is like where the treatment can diffuse and it can impact someone else's outcome. So like with a, um, uh, like right now with COVID, right? Like, so we do cluster randomized trials when we do infectious diseases because me getting the vaccine impacts your ability to get to, to have COVID. Yeah, and I, I have to do cluster randomized trials with my sexual assault prevention work because we, um, if I train a school, the kids can train each other and they actually even might, you know, sometimes like even like train other schools, but I have to worry about like keeping them clustered. I can't train some of the kids at a school and not others because they'll start sharing our program, which is wonderful that they share it, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't not, it's no longer an individual level randomization. So there's a lot of other subtleties there. Um, but, um, you know, uh, Larry Moulton, who's at Johns Hopkins, and I forget his co-author have a wonderful book on cluster randomized trials, and they sort of tee off in the beginning about like um, pros and cons and that kind of stuff. So Larry Moulton at, at Johns Hopkins. 
Uh, we have probably time for just two last uh, questions that sort of related um, have transfer distance being factored in the analysis. And so also Hussein asked, like maybe uh, like Google Map recommend the same path to everybody create more traffic. How, sure. you know, uh, oh, Mike, could you resolve yeah. that? Yeah. So, okay. So let me go with um, the transfer distances. Yes. So we did think a lot about what these distances are. So we have, um, it turns out that on average or not on average, the median difference between getting care for a patient at the closest hospital, um, or the, sorry, the hospital they, they were treated at versus moving them to a high level hospital was only, the median was only 20 extra miles. Um, so, you know, if you really believe, you know, that's not a huge difference. Uh, I mean, sorry, if you're in like New York City or something like that, that's, that's, that can be, or LA, that's a long time. Um, but uh, 20 miles can be made in a more manageable way. Um, so, uh, also people will move these patients by helicopter, um, often because it is such a high risk kind of thing, but they can get them stable enough to move them. Um, uh, but let, let, Hussein's, Hussein's question is really interesting. Uh, and what, what's happening there is this sort of like emergent property or something like that, where if we start like overloading high level hospitals, maybe like, this is like an introduction, uh, it, we're introducing maybe like a little bit of interference problem where like, um, if we're just moving one or two patients in, maybe care doesn't degrade. But if we start moving thousands of patients in, like now everybody gets overwhelmed and things get, so that could happen. And in our analysis, we are not able, or uh, we did not address that issue. Um, for type A dissections, we're lucky that that may not actually happen, right? So there, it's probably unlikely to get some overwhelming effects or something like that. You um, might imagine like in, in a hospital, we're not going to be sending all of a sudden like 20 type A dissections because there's just not that many within, you know, within one week or something like that. You could actually imagine that things would get better if what's happening is the experience with type A is what's helping people. As you start regionalizing, the bigger centers should get better because they'll have more experience. Um, uh, there's another part of the question. Yeah, I th there's there's some real, um, you know, I'm going to, should I put my email address into the, so yeah. I think these are some really good questions. And if other people want like, to ask, uh, I, I can't answer some of these quickly, but um, I would love to talk more with folks who want to know more. So I'm yeah. dropping my email into the. Um, right. Appreciate the that. All right. We're sort of running out of time, but um, I hope many of the questions can be addressed in here. I want to thank you, Mike, very much for coming online today and hope everybody enjoyed this. Uh, probably we're going to put, put up the recording to our channel if you if you don't mind, like we discussed earlier. And again, really appreciate you coming. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, and thank you, thank you right. for inviting. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, have a nice one. Bye-bye.